Adolf Hitler was bad, uh, but what the uh, Muslims want to do to the Jews is worse. Good evening from Los Angeles, I'm Tavis Smiley. Tonight I look at perhaps the most misunderstood world religion, Islam. I think Muhammad was a terrorist. Islam was founded by Muhammad, a demon-possessed pedophile who had 12 wives, and his last one was a nine-year-old girl. Iran's president not only attacking uh, the Israel, but also saying, listen, nuclear options, we can Our do Our next guess is it's if you think important. Islam is an ancient religion out of touch with the modern world, you're a bit out of touch yourself. He says that Muslims are in the twilight of a reformation and that many are ready to create an Islamic democracy. Well, first of all, let me just say something very, very clearly, and that is that if this is an act of al-Qaeda, then it is yet another example of this depraved and inexcusable actions of these immoral, godless individuals who are manipulating the faith of a billion Muslims to justify their murderous ideology, and they're going to pay for this. They're going to pay for this in this life. They're going to pay for this Aslan, in the next uh, life. And read a couple of things that you've said and bring you into the discussion here. Ayatollahs, mullahs in Iran, not more fundamentalist than members of the United States Congress? Well, look, no, no religion that aspires to anything more than metaphysical contemplation can remain indifferent to the realities of the secular world. It's perfectly natural for religion to have an influence in politics. I mean, I think that the, the difference between a democracy and a theocracy is not secularism, but pluralism. I would argue that religion plays a dominant role in American politics, as it does in a number of uh, modern democracies. Religion, as, as the senator was saying, is, whether we like it or not, the moral foundation of our country. It's, in this case, a Protestant moral foundation. So. I don't in any way say that the U.S. and Iran share the same freedoms and the same liberties. Of course, that's not true. Iran is a clerical oligarchy. But nonetheless, uh, I think that the same people who, in the United States, who talk about uh, bringing out the, the moral values that, um, upon which this country was founded, uh, tend to have a different view when those moral values are Islamic. I want to make sure that this is something that's that's going to be, you know, educational. That could be something that that is really going to put me uh, very much along the lines of a Joseph Campbell or a Houston Smith, uh, someone who is a, a public intellectual who talks about religion, the meaning of religion in, in the world, and who does it in an entertaining way that really appeals to a wide audience. Hey, Chip, it's Reza. Could you just give me a call when you get this message? Um, the 1970s was a very strange time to grow up in, in Iran. I mean, the pre-revolutionary fervor was everywhere, and you could, you could sense it in every little detail. The Iran of my childhood was filled with family. I mean, we lived in a sprawling home. with It was my family, my father's three brothers, and their family, their wives, their children. The days leading up to the exile of the Shah were really tense. You know, we never left the house. It was enormously quiet. It was, it was eerily quiet. And then suddenly you would hear bursts of gunfire. You would hear shouting or you would hear an explosion in the distance. And then, of course, when the Shah left, the, the foreboding sounds of the streets were replaced by this roar of excitement. And it was the sounds that drew us outside of, of our apartment and, and took us onto the streets where we just saw waves upon waves, an ocean of people uh, in celebration, dancing and, and singing, and talking about words like freedom and, and democracy and, and independence. These ideas that were too complex for a seven-year-old to understand, but, but I understood that there was this power in these words and a promise in these words that was very excited to be a part of, very excited. I didn't want to leave. I wanted to stay and see what, what was going to come out of this, but I didn't have that opportunity. I remember my mother crying out, don't lose your sister. I can still hear the terrifying breathlessness of her voice, as though she were warning me that if I let go of my little sister's hand, she would be left behind. I gripped her fingers so tightly she began to cry and dragged her roughly toward the gate kicking at the knees around us to make way. Welcome, Ressa Aslan. Ressa, come on up. How are you, sir? Nice to see you. Nice to be here. Thanks. 
very cool to be here. I think, uh, I think most people, when, when they hear religious scholar, think younger than you. <laughs> well. This book, No God But God, I think people in America very interested in, it says the origins, evolution, and future of Islam. I think our biggest thing would be future. Uh, what's, uh, what, are they, what, 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 what do you got planned? <laughs> well, I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> Relations between the Islamic world and the West began in conflict. And for the last six decades, America and our allies excused and accommodated the lack of freedom in the Middle East, hoping, as President Bush said, to purchase stability at the price of liberty. Of course, we got neither. Iran's previous revolutions in 1905 and 1953 were hijacked by foreigners whose interests were served by suppressing democracy in the region. The revolution of 1979 was hijacked by the country's own clerical establishment, who used their moral authority to gain absolute power. This counter-revolution, however, despite the brutally intransigent response it has thus far received from Iran's clerical oligarchy, must not be quelled. I mean, if you want to see this, this reformation playing itself out, you just need to go to Tehran and see this schism between those who are actively reconciling their, their beliefs, their values with, with the realities of the modern world, and those who are reacting against those realities, pushing back on those realities. That is because the fight for Islamic democracy in Iran is merely one front in a worldwide battle taking place in the Muslim world, a jihad, if you will. Like the reformations of the past, this will be a terrifying event. But out of the ashes of the cataclysm, a new chapter in the story of Islam will emerge. Terrifying, that's a scary word. Well, I mean, that's, it, it'll, it'll be cataclysmic. Uh, most religious reformations are. I think that there's another way of looking at this. On one hand, we can look at it narrowly and say, oh my God, the world is coming to an end. All the, the, the fundamentalists are taken over. Uh, everybody's getting crazy. On the other hand, you could broaden your perspective and say, well, if I'm seeing this surge in, in the reaction to modernism and, and secularism, then it must be modernism and secularism that is, that is really surging and taking, taking off. And that these reactionary movements, which will always exist, uh, are going to fall by the wayside as they always do. I mean, I'm not hearing anything from the organized moderate voice of Islam in the Middle East. Why not? Well, I hate to say this, but you're not listening hard enough. I mean, this, this is a movement that is just enormous and overwhelming. But unfortunately, for some reason, we are not that cognizant of it here in the United States. Now, perhaps that may be because it's just not sexy enough for the media. But doesn't the message have to be you, heard here? Don't they the message, have to get the message listened to here? Yes, and that's precisely what the responsibility for those of us who are first and second generation Muslim immigrants in North America, in Europe, that's, that's the responsibility that we have. Now, the American Muslim community, according to most estimates, now outnumbers American Jews as the largest religious minority in the United States. We need to come together as our Jewish and brothers and sisters did. And we need to recognize that our voices, our values, our interests can no longer be ignored, either in, in domestic affairs or in foreign policy affairs. And here is a thought. Here is a radical, radical thought. Why do we not make Iraq our Israel? Let's see what would happen if we come together and we agree on one thing and one thing only, and that is a stable, viable, democratic, indigenous democracy in Iraq. And Iraq for Iraqis is good, not just for all Muslims, but for all peoples of the world. Imagine the kind of power that we would have as, as Muslims in this country. We cannot allow our voices to be ignored, but there's only one way to do that. And that is to come together, to, to revel in our diversity, because that's what makes us Americans, but also to find unity in that diversity to be one as God is one. We ought to take, we ought to take every single Muslim student in every college in this nation and ship them back to where they came from.
You spent some time in Iran recently. Yeah, I just got back uh, a few months ago. What, what are they thinking? They, they, they digging us in any way? Or they... I, think See, I would think they'd be ripe for us because I would think that their enemy is the theocracy Absolutely. and they would actually think that we're sort of cool. No, it's, it, I mean, the overwhelming majority of Iranians are absolutely fed up with, with the, with the uh, clerical oligarchy there. And everyone knows that the end is coming. I mean, the clerics know the so end is coming. So you see this as, you see the, the, the extremist movement of Islam as winding down, not heating up. We look at it as right. this war is just beginning. You see it as coming to an end. It is coming to an end. And what one sometimes says is, well, what about what's happening in Iran now with the election of Ahmadinejad and the seemingly about face that Iran has suddenly taken, that suddenly it's more conservative again and suddenly it's more fundamentalist now because look at this president that they elected. Well, it, nobody elected Ahmadinejad because of his religious ideology. Nobody really knew anything about Ahmadinejad. This is a man who had never run for office before in his life. He was appointed mayor of Tehran. And a, and a man who basically ran for office on a single issue, and that is the economy, uh, which is what every Iranian, regardless of what they feel about their social circumstances or their religious ideologies, has in common. This is a, this is a society in which 70% of the population is under the age of 30, in which the vast majority of the population want nothing to do with the government as, as, it, as it currently is, but has, has no access to any kind of change because there's really no middle class left in, in Iran. I mean, think about it for a second. Open up that country, open that door just a little creek, and it will fly open. There's no way to stop Iranians if they actually had access to the rest of the world. What the mullahs don't want is access. And so they love Ahmadinejad. They love it. They let him spout his idiotic, you know, let's, let's kill all Jews all day long. They love it because it doesn't mean anything. He has no power. He makes no decisions. And all he does is just continue to, to put Iran in such a situation as to put more and more and more power into, into the hands of the unelected clerics. I think to really understand what's happening, you need to talk to the university students, the politicians, the thinkers, the theologians. If I were to frame it in the guise of other great reformations, I would say that it's going to be the powerful who provide the path for which the people can then define the reformation. And unfortunately, as it is right now, the people who have the loudest voice are those who are ramming planes into buildings. What we need to do is make sure that there are those who have another agenda, a, an ideological counterweight to these ideologies of fanaticism and bigotry that, that we see throughout the Muslim world, that those voices are heard. تورات مصرف مرگ انسان ها میان میرن فایده چیز تفکر روز پوچ اعمال بیهود کارنامه زندگی فشار اکسال عمل منحرف مقصر غلط نام دیر یا رحیت این سرت اونجا از افق زیبا فرزند بیا دنگ هر چیز جایید که چیز گرفت این وجوبه مگه میشه احترام گذاشت به این شخص که میفکر کفیم بعد اون خوبه من ندیدم دوستن و بیا با هم